the question around the religious centers, uh, Lagos is trying to slowly ease back into normal activity in terms of living with COVID-19. And part of our normal activity is, uh, as we are so accustomed to, gathering for spiritual worship. Um, so we're, we're trying to get back to normal, and back to normal is, is uh, being, having a spiritual experience or going to a spiritual gathering is part of getting back to normal. So Mr. Governor has announced the criteria for returning to uh, centers of spiritual worship. They are to exercise a certain amount of um, capacity in terms of the capacity of the room. They are to break up into multiple sessions and um, for a defined period of time. We are particularly concerned about, we are particularly concerned about the vulnerable age group, which is the 65 and above, is where we have defined the vulnerable age group, based on our statistics, based on the pattern of infection in Lagos. Uh, we find that over the age of 60, 65, or 70, uh, Lagosians, particularly if they have other problems like diabetes and hypertension may be particularly vulnerable to COVID-19, in other words, to develop severe complications. So we're trying to suggest that if you're over the age of 65, you should not go to these houses of worship, and in fact, you should continue to exercise due diligence as to where you go and to what kind of environment you go to and to reduce the chances of you coming into contact with somebody who is transmitting the virus. As we've said, we're in a state of active community transmission, which means that many people you will come into contact with will have the infection, and we know that most people will have the infection and not even know they have the infection. So you may come across anybody who is actually secreting the virus and not looking particularly unwell. So we want to protect the elderly members of our community at this point in time when we know that the virus is spreading easily in community. If you don't need to go out, you don't particularly need to um, go to shopping, you can send other people to the shops, you can carry out your spiritual experience at home, um, for now, we are advising that over the age of 65, um, avoid these um, engagements. Now, for those that do go to this engagement and go back home, that's the question. What happens? Well, those that do go to the houses of spiritual worship, while you're there, we've cut down the number of people that can be in a room. And while you're in that room, you must practice what we are standardizing as social distancing so that it reduces your chance of contracting the virus and taking the virus home to where you may have somebody in the house who is over the age of 60, 65 or 70 and who has um, uh, pre-existing medical conditions that can make you vulnerable to developing a severe form of COVID-19. Regarding the rapid diagnostic test, now this is a very big issue, and I'm glad that you asked this question. So rapid diagnostic tests are those cassettes that are, you see them on social media. There are quite a number of them in the market now. There are several issues around the rapid diagnostic test. First of all, it's important that you know there are two types. There's the first type test for antibodies. And that test will determine whether you have caught the virus and you have developed antibodies to the virus. The second rapid diagnostic test is for the antigen. It's actually looking for the virus. You do the test for the antigen or the virus and it is positive. There should be the virus in your body. It's usually a swab 
from your nose or from your mouth. If you do the antibody test, which is usually a blood test from a finger prick, you have antibodies to the virus if it is positive, which means you have had the virus or you are actually still having the virus. It may mean, depending on the pattern of the result, and somebody who is experienced in tell that you've had the virus and you've recovered or that you are still actively having the virus and you're obese to the virus. These rapid diagnostic tests are fast. You should get the result widespread testing and get results very quickly. The problem is these tests, majority of them are extremely inaccurate. And when we say inaccurate, it means you can be positive and the test will tell you you are negative. Or you can be negative and the test will tell you you are positive. Now can you imagine the consequences of this kind of false results? So for example, if you are positive and the test says you are negative, you will go back home with the confidence that you do not have COVID and you will spread the virus to people, maybe even your grandmother in the house who is vulnerable and your grandmother will get sick and she may get extremely unwell. So that's one side of it. If you are in fact negative and the test says you are positive, then they will now put you in an isolation center. You didn't have COVID before, but by the time you get into that isolation center, that's where you will catch the COVID. So you can see the problem. And some of these tests, there is nowhere in the world where they have found a rapid test that is accurate enough for us to use yet. Because of the danger of the consequences of the inaccuracy. So we are well aware that there are rapid diagnostic tests available on the market in Lagos. They have not been validated by the Lagos State Ministry of Health, and as a, as a result, so by law, you cannot use a product that has not been registered by NAFTAC. And if you are using this product either for yourself, or you are selling it, or you are performing a test for a fee, you are breaking the law. And the respective agencies that are supposed to regulate the law will eventually catch up with you. So we're saying, in the interest of public safety, wait until a rapid diagnostic test has been validated by the um, appropriate entity. The results are submitted to NAFDAQ, and if NAFDAQ is happy with the results, they will register that product. As of today, no such um, validation and NAFDAQ has not registered any rapid diagnostic. Me, why is the case is because the vendors of these rapid diagnostic tests are not submitting their tests for validation. So if you have a rapid diagnostic test, they'd rather sell it on the black market illegally because it does not have a NAFTAC registration. So if you sell it, you're selling it illegally. And the people that are using, using it are using it at their own risk because so far we've not been able to identify a rapid diagnostic test kit that is accurate. So if the vendors are confident about their product, they should come forward and submit their product for validation and then put it through the test. If it is accurate enough for us to use, we will submit that data to NAFDAQ and NAFDAQ will register your product and then you can sell it. And the now remember that COVID-19 is a public health crisis 
and therefore all the data around COVID-19 is to be registered with the government. So if you are even performing a rapid diagnostic test, government must give you permission to perform so that if it is positive, it can be recorded as and a statistic. You cannot be diagnosing COVID-19 in, in community and not informing government that we have a positive COVID-19 case in so-and-so local government. Every positive case of COVID-19 must be known to the government. Now, if you do a COVID-19 test on a rapid diagnostic test and it is positive, as I've told you, many of these tests limitation on their accuracy, which means if you're positive on a rapid test, we still have to confirm it with the molecular test or what we call the PCR test, because only the PCR test is 100% accurate. So just to be sure that you have COVID-19, if the rapid diagnostic test says you are positive, we would still perform the benchmark test on you, but it may give us some confidence in managing you till we get the result of the PCR test. Similarly, if your rapid diagnostic test is negative, but you are still exhibiting the features of COVID-19, it's likely that that test is wrong and therefore you should be subject to the standard benchmark test or the PCR test so that we know with 100% accuracy whether you have COVID-19 or not. The next question was around home. Based. We are, as a government, de redefining our strategy because as you know, we've been testing more. We've been escalating our capacity to test for COVID-19. And what we found is that the more we test, the more we find, which is a reflection of the fact that COVID-19 is spreading within the community. And we're finding more cases than we can manage eventually when we project if we carry on with the rate of positive testing that we're obtaining, we're going to run out of isolation beds in our established isolation facilities. Therefore, we are projecting, if we keep getting 150, 200 positives every day, in another two or three weeks, even though we are opening new isolation centers all the time, in time, we're going to run out of beds. And this has happened all over the world. It's not just Lagos or Nigeria. Every other country has reached the same tipping point where you now have to transition from managing patients in an isolation center to managing patients who are not that unwell at home and reserving the isolation centers for people who are feeling unwell and need to be monitored more closely by medical personnel. We have not started yet strategic transition. We have to put a number of things in place. We'll be operating primarily from the primary healthcare platform. In other words, the primary healthcare centers. That is where we're going to decide who will be managed at home and who will be managed in isolation centers. And there are many criteria for deciding who qualifies to be managed at home and who qualifies to be managed at an isolation center. Part of the criteria is, is your home adequate for home management? That's one. And the second part of the criteria is, are you well enough to be managed at home? If you are feeling very unwell and you're having breathing problems, then obviously Home is not a place that we can manage you. It is better for us to move you to an isolation center where we can monitor you more closely um, uh, and ensure that you get the appropriate care to help you to get better and avoid getting to the point where you are extremely distressed from breathing problems. So in the next week or two, we're going to start to develop 
the strategies and put things in place for uh, deploying home-based care. Uh, it requires a lot of strategic planning. It's also quite expensive, um, and we need to recruit. We need to define some policies and strategies, and all that is taking place as we speak, so that in another week or two, we're going to start initiating community and home-based management of COVID-19. We also have to spend a bit of time educating the public through our local governments and all our major stakeholders. We have to start engaging with stakeholders and explaining the principle of home-based care. We haven't done that yet. We're just giving that information out now that this is something that is going to come in the future. It is not unusual. It has happened all over the world. We're just preparing the people of Lagos for the fact that we're going to start to give you information and build your knowledge around the principles of managing patients in community. So that when you all have enough information, then we will start to roll out the plan um, and we would have the safety of the patients that will be managed at home and of course the other members of their families that are in the vicinity of that home. The other question was the numbers around the increasing deaths. Well, you know, as the outbreak increases, in other words, as the number of infected people is rising, you then will naturally expect that the number of patients that develop severe complications from COVID will also rise. What we have discovered is that our death rate from COVID is just above 1%. So as the numbers increase, when you apply 1% of 2,000, you will get 20. If you apply 1% of 5,000, uh, you will get 50. So it's mathematics. As the numbers of people with COVID increases, we're going to naturally see an increased number of people who develop severe complications of COVID. And if you develop severe complications of COVID, if you develop severe complications of COVID, that is when you are at risk of dying. So it's not unexpected, but our numbers are still much smaller than when you look at Europe or America or South America where people are dying in the thousands our death number is still under 100, and we've been inside COVID for almost four months now. So that shows you that certainly in Lagos, for some reason, our management, our people, our environment, the death rate from COVID is certainly not as high as what we see around the world. Thank you. Yes, 
So you are asking more about the details of home-based care. As I said, we're working out the um, process. Essentially, let me just talk about it in principle. Um, if you are diagnosed with COVID-19, you either have asymptomatic, mild, moderate, or severe features. In other words, you either are positive for COVID and you don't feel anything, is what we describe as asymptomatic, or you just have a mild, you may just have some body ache and headache and that's it. Or you may be moderate, in, in which case you'll be feeling generally unwell and weak, you may lose your appetite, or you may be severe. In other words, you are generally looking and feeling very sick and you're having breathing problems. So naturally, we're going to define who can be managed at home and who can be managed in a isolation facility. It's a bit um, of a simple decision. If you're asymptomatic or you have mild disease, you qualify really to be managed at home simply because most people in that category will naturally get well without even any medical intervention. After all, if you are not feeling any symptoms, you don't even know you have COVID, nothing happens to you. After seven to 10 days, you clear the virus. The people that we want to pay close attention to are those people that are moderate to severe. In other words, then they've lost their appetite, they have persistent fever, they are very weak, and they're developing respiratory symptoms. Those people are not suitable for home-based care, and they should be moved to an isolation center so that we can monitor them closely. Now, even if you are asymptomatic for some days, you may become symptomatic and develop moderate to severe diseases. So when we're managing you at home, we're going to be monitoring you, and we have various ways of monitoring you. We'll call you by phone. People will come and visit you. Your family members can call us. We've developed the ECHO telemed. You can see them being displayed on the screen. And we can have a consultation with you inside your house without actually coming to your house. So we have developed many ways of monitoring your progress while you're at home. And we're going to give you a COVID-19 care pack where you can measure your temperature, you can measure your oxygen, and we'll give you certain vitamins and uh, painkillers just a more comfortable time while you're isolating at home with mild or asymptomatic disease. We have the manpower. We have enough personnel at the primary healthcare level to carry out these visitations. We have a lot of volunteers that have been conscripted and they are being trained as we speak. And these are the staff and the manpower that we're going to deploy to the home-based community care strategy that we're planning. Yes, Mr. Governor is still in the position to consider um, subsidizing health at the primary and the secondary level because we don't want COVID to affect 
non-COVID patients. So we don't want people to stay away from the hospital uh, because, you know, the doctors are... Uh, it, it would give the impression that doctors are concentrating on COVID-19. That's not true. Many of our doctors are not involved in COVID-19. We've done it that way to make sure that there are doctors that are attending to COVID-19 and there are doctors, in fact, more doctors that are to remain in their position attending to non-COVID illnesses. Because if you don't do it that way, you may find that you're getting problems where people are dying or getting very sick from non-COVID uh, conditions because they are being neglected. So just to make sure that Lagosians have access to health care, we've encouraged that attendance at our medical facilities by subsidizing health so that you pay sometimes nothing or you pay a lot less for your treatment at our primary health care and our secondary health care general hospitals. Yes, um, the requirement for oxygen is increasing and uh, Mr. Governor correctly announced that we're looking into generating our own oxygen because we normally send our tanks to be filled up but if we have our own plant then we can generate our own oxygen so that we have abundant oxygen. As the numbers of patients, as I described, is increasing because the numbers of people who are positive is increasing, then we're more likely to see people who are in the severe category of COVID-19. And generally speaking, what they need is adequate supply of oxygen. So again, we're planning ahead. We don't want to find ourselves in a situation where we're under stress for access to oxygen. So thinking ahead and planning ahead, we're planning to get a couple of oxygen generating plants in some of our major hospitals so we have an abundant supply of oxygen for our patients. Mm -hmm. So you asked about private hospitals or private um, engagements. How does the private sector engage with the government COVID-19 response? Well, we're doing this in two ways. First of all, we're engaging with uh, private laboratories that want to test, want to partner with government to test for COVID-19. This engagement is active. We've identified several private sector laboratories that have the capacity to perform a COVID-19 test. Remember, this test is very complicated. Not every laboratory can do it. It requires very sophisticated equipment, and it requires certain personnel that have specialized training. So it's not every laboratory can do COVID-19 PCR testing. Only a handful of laboratories have the equipment have the required environment and have the required medical personnel that can perform the test accurately. As a result of that, these handful of laboratories that have volunteered to contribute to COVID-19 testing, we're going through the process of checking that they have the correct um, requirements for them to do an accurate test. And we're going to test them to see that when they perform the test, that they're actually producing accurate results. Once we go through that process, then we'll give them validation and accreditation by testing on behalf of government uh, as private sector partners in the COVID-19. Similarly, for managing patients, we have gone through the process of accrediting three private hospitals. Uh, one is already admitting patients, and two are going to start admitting patients any moment from now. They've passed the BIOS. They've made modifications to their hospitals so that their staff are not put in danger. And other patients that may go to the hospital are not put in a position of higher risk of contracting COVID-19. 
private hospitals have passed the test and we're just in the process of giving them their accreditation so that they can start managing COVID-19 in the private sector. However, even if you're managing COVID-19 in the private sector, it still comes under the supervision of the Lagos State Government Ministry of Health. As I said before, every person with COVID-19 in Lagos State must be known to the government. Every person with COVID-19 must be known to the government. If you are managing COVID-19 without government permission, and we are not capturing that person in our database, you are performing an illegal act according to the laws of Lagos State. So if you want to manage private sector, we're not saying you cannot. All you have to do is submit your application, let us visit your hospital, make sure that you have the required environment for managing COVID, that your staff are trained, and once you demonstrate that you can do that, then we'll give you your credentials for managing COVID-19, and every patient that you manage, you submit that information to us so that we can record it, because this remains a public health crisis, I see are managed and supervised by Lagos State Government and by extension, the Federal Government of Nigeria. Lagos has been ramping up testing dramatically. If you look at our data, we've performed over 22,000 tests and we are increasing our capacity to carry out tests more and more every day. We are now at about the capacity to perform 1,000 tests per day, and we're looking to rise that number, or to raise that number to 2,000 or 3,000 per day, so that we can test anybody and everybody that needs testing or wishes to be tested because of a reason to go back to work, or maybe you work in an industry where we need to know that you're COVID-19 negative. So very soon, the rate at which we are testing is going to keep rising. And don't be alarmed, because the more we test, when you see the low number, it's because they're not testing. So when you see Lagos numbers are very high, testing a lot. And the more you test, the more you find. And Lagos is not hiding anything. What we do, we transmit to you the same day. If we test 3,000 patients today, we're going to find maybe 500. And if we publish that 500, we don't want you to be alarmed. The number of positives we find is a factor of the amount of testing we do. Now, the people of Lagos want us to test more, and we are going to test more. But as we test more, and therefore, Please don't be alarmed. It's just the fact that we're finding the people in the community who are positive for the virus. But as I said before, most people will and have an asymptomatic or mild disease profile. Thank you. I think I've answered uh, most of your questions.